بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين عن عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو مستند إلي يقول اللهم اغفر لي وارحمني والحقني بالرفيق الأعلى These chapters are about disease and visiting sick people. What should the sick person do himself or herself if a person realizes that these are the last days of his or her life? What dua should that person make? What should we do after the person's death? And how to treat the dead body? How to treat the family of the deceased person? These are the tap chapters that we will have here. We covered some of them in our previous sessions. This session here that I just recited the hadith from is about what should that person say who knows that these are the last moments or the last days of his life or her life. Aisha radiallahu anha says that I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying while he was leaning against me and these were in the last days of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life. He was saying, Allahumma ghfir li warhamni. Ya Allah, forgive me and have mercy on me. Walhiqni bil rafiq al-a'la. And join me with that exalted companion, which means take me back to you. This hadith, as it teaches us the dua to be recited at the time when the person realizes that these are his last days. At the same time, when you look at the wording of the dua, we realize that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for three things. Number one, maghfirah. The forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, rahmah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the two very important things that the person need before his and her death. For Allah to forgive us and have mercy on us. Because we all are sinners. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every human being commits sin. Subhanallah, when you look at these hadith, each and every hadith has so many lessons for us, so many messages for us. I remember once, someone trying to relate some of the mistakes of another person to me and trying to convince me that you think good of him and you sometimes speak good of him, he's not good. And the way he's proving to me that he's not good by mentioning some of his faults, some of his wrongdoings. So I said to him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every human being commits sins. If you want to count sins, 
you will be able to count sins of any person in the world. And I said to that person, if you want, at this time, you can tell me at least 50 or 100 mistakes of your own parents. But you like to cover those up. You don't like to speak of your own sins, of your parents' sins, of your family's sins. So there is no human being in this world who does not do wrong. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, But the thing is, The best of those who commit sins are the ones who would seek Allah's forgiveness. So if that person is trying to live a good life, trying to live a life according to the sunnah, according to the sharia, and within that course, he keeps on making mistakes, he keeps on committing sins. It's part of the life. As long as we know that this person is trying his best, alhamdulillah, this is a good person. This is what the human beings can do. Try. Try our best. At the end, we will find ourselves doing something wrong. And of course, these mistakes, sometimes they become a good rahmah because after we see that we are doing something wrong, we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many times we don't realize that we are doing something wrong. Realizing that we are doing something wrong is a great rahmah of Allah. When a person does not realize that he or she is doing something wrong and keeps on looking at other people's mistakes, this person is not only a sinner, at the same time is misguided. Does not even see his or her sins. So to realize that we are sinners and to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by itself is rahmah of Allah. So every human being commits sins. And f therefore, we need the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises us in Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah Haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun Fear Allah, have the taqwa of Allah as much as he deserves to be worshipped and as much as fear him according to his greatness. Now, how to have that type of taqwa, that level of taqwa? The way of achieving that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Make sure you die in the status of Islam. That you have Islam when you die. Which simply means keep on doing the virtuous deeds. Now, how can we make sure that we die with this Islam? What is the way of having a surety for this? How can we guarantee ourselves that we will die with Iman? Mufassirin have explained under this ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he ordered us have the taqwa that taqwa, if the person will try to live the life of taqwa in this world, Allah guarantees that person that you would die with Islam. But if the person does not even try to live, live the life of taqwa, does not care about what type of life he or she lives, and that person thinks that, okay, later on we will change. We're too young to do these things at this time. We will change later on. We will do these de deeds some other time when our parents advise us. We say, you know, we know what they have done when they were young. I'm not that old yet. Of course, it's another trick of shaitan. Who knows when we would die? How many people die in car accidents? While the person was listening to some of those haram things that are forbidden by Allah and His Messenger وسلم, never got a chance to seek Allah's forgiveness. Died while committing a sin. 
This is why it's a blessing of Allah when the person gets an opportunity before his death to say, Allahumma li warhamni. Ya Allah, forgive me and have mercy on me. There are so many incidents when people at the time of their the death, <coughs> instead of saying, Allahumma li warhamni, they are singing some songs. They are saying things that are related to their businesses or things that they used to do in their lives. There are a lot of those incidents. So the way of assuring ourselves that insha'Allah we will be saying Allahumma ghfir li warhamni is to live a type of life where we are always seeking the forgiveness of Allah, we are seeking the rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. And in the akhirah, this is what we need. Our deeds are nothing there. If Allah would not forgive us, there is no way that we can make it. And if Allah will not have rahmah and mercy on us, we can never stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and show Him that we have done anything good. So, maghfira and rahmah, two very important things that we need. And we need them for our de- for after our death. And in order to be able to have those after our death, we should live a type of life where we are always, the life is proving that we are looking for the forgiveness of Allah, we are looking for the rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we prove to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our lifestyles, through our deeds, that we really indeed we need His rahmah. We are looking forward to have His rahmah and His maghfirah, His forgiveness. Insha'Allah, He will have it. We will get it from Him. And, of course, Rasulullah, <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, And the hadith is hadith Qudusi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana inda zanni abdi. I treat people according to what they think of me. I treat people according to what they think of me. Now, as you go back and you read this hadith to some people who are not looking to live a life of taqwa, they are not aware of the whole Islam. They just. They just hear a few things about Islam. They're Muslims because they were born in a Muslim family. Right away they will say, okay, I have a good hope so I don't have to do no good deeds. Of course, this is not the life of taqwa. We all can understand this. But there is hadith also that explains this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-kayyisu mandana nafsa wa amila lima ba'd al-mawt. Why is a person who controls his desire, controls himself, and prepares for the life after death in this world. The deeds that the person performs are a preparation for life after death. وَالْعَاجِزْ مَنْ أَتْبَعَ نَفْسَهُ هَوَاهَا Loser is the one who keeps on following his desires and وَتَمَنَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْأَمَانِي and keep on having big hopes from Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, not to do what we are supposed to do. Not to do what we are asked to do by Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And just to have hopes. This is a sign of being loser in Akhirah. So these just hopes are not going to help. We have to prove through our deeds. And with every good deed that we perform. This will be only a way of proving that we are trying to get the rahmah and the forgiveness of Allah, that we love Allah, we like to obey Allah. Otherwise, our deeds are not good enough to be able to be presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not good enough to take us to Jannah, but these are only some ways of proving that Ya Allah, I love you, so I'm trying to do this for you. And through that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rahmah, and he showers his mercy on us by just proving, trying to prove by our broken deeds. By our salah, where we are not even concentrating, but at least we are proving that Ya Allah, I'm trying. This trying will help on the day of judgment.
When we say that Allah is Rahim, merciful, forgiving one, this is what it means that you just try with these type of deeds that we perform and with all so many other wrong doings and deeds that we are doing within that, still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and He looks at our good deeds and He says, okay, as if He doesn't see the bad parts of it, as if He doesn't real, uh, see that there are so many wrong things within this good deed, He just accepts that deed as it is. And he says, okay, this is salah. Okay, I take it as a salah. Without looking what was in the side, inside the salah. Once I visited a scholar in Medina Munawwara. Who was laying on his deathbed. <coughs> he said to me. First thing, of course, he was talking about akhirah. A person who lived throughout his life. In the ibadah of Allah. And the whole life of that person is being spent in accordance with the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So of course all he's thinking about at that time is meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he started weeping and he said to me. He said, I have a big hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, you know why? I said, why? He said, because sometime when you present a gift to someone, you give them some flowers made out of plastic, out of papers. And you give them that as a gift and the person sees it that this is okay flower, but it's not a real flower. It's made out of something else. Artificial flower. It's made out of plastic. It's made out of paper. That person accepts your gift and he appreciates it. And he says, so beautiful. See how nice it looks. Look at the color of it. And there might be some artificial uh, fragrance in it. And he smells it and he says, oh, it smells so nice. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how... He is going to deal with us also on the Day of Judgment that we will present Him with our Salah. It's not a real Salah. It's artificial Salah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of Rahmah, He will say, Okay, you know my servant, oh, you brought so much Salah for me. You did every Salah on its time. MashaAllah, come on, go to Jannah. This is the Rahmah of Allah. So, having hope in the forgiveness of Allah and the Rahmah of Allah, it's a big thing. And of course, the whole life, the way we spend our life will decide if we will have that hope at the time of death or we won't. It's not only the last moments of the person's life. The whole life decides. And of course, when I say the whole life, simply means if a person changes at any point in his life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the person hidayah at any time of his life. Might be only a few days before the person's death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the person the hidayah and the person started coming to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He thought of coming back to the deen of Allah. And now of course then this is the lifestyle that the person has chosen for him or herself at that time. And at the time of death, this is the lifestyle that the person was living. Inshallah that will give the person a great hope in the rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if a person dies while living a different lifestyle, that is a person who will not have hope in the Rahmah of Allah. Look at the next part of the hadith. Very important part. وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالْرَفِيقِ الْأَعْلَى And <coughs> take me back to you. Have me meet the exalted companion. Which means, Ya Allah, I look forward now to come back to you. Normally, we are afraid to go back and see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either because sometimes the uh, people dislike death because of the things that they have in this world. Oh, I have family, I have this, and they're worried about these things. Of course, that's not a good worry at the time of death. 
But sometimes we are afraid to go back and see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala die and we are afraid of our death because we know we are sinners. We are afraid to be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all of these deeds. If that is the reason of fear, then of course the person should be doing what will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the type of things that we feel that at least I can be able to go back and see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with something like this. At least try for that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith, Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa'ahu. A person who loves to see Allah, Allah loves to see that person. And a person who hates to see Allah, wa man kariha liqa Allah, kariha Allahu liqa'ahu. A person who hates to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislike to see Allah, Allah dislike to see that person and will not have rahmah on that person. Dislike to see the person simply means will not shower his rahmah and blessing on that person. Aisha radiallahu anha asked a question. Ya Rasulullah, we all are afraid of our death. Because we are afraid to stand before Allah. It's not because we dislike to go to Allah, but we are afraid to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are sinners. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if a person is afraid to die because of that reason, at the time of his death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show that person the good place he will be seeing after his death, will open a door to Jannah for that person to see before the person's death. So that person at that time, he likes to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah loves to see that person. And if the person was sinner and he spent his life as a sinner in this world, does not change, did not want, was he was not trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his deeds. At the time of death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the door to Jahannam for that person. So that person before his or her death will be able to look inside the Jahannam and will know that this is where I'm going to. And therefore, the person would dislike death <coughs> at that time. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, a person who dislikes seeing Allah, it's at that time, not throughout our life. At that time, at this time, we all might be afraid of death. And there is nothing wrong with that. But at the time of death, when the person knows that these are the last moments of my life, and at that time, Allah opens up the door either to the Jannah or Jahannam, God forbid if the door to the Jahannam is open to the person, that person dislikes the death at that time and dislike going back to Allah because he knows if I go back to Allah, this is what I get over there. So Allah dislikes seeing that person and will not have rahmah and will not shower his rahmah and forgiveness on this person. So this dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's a very important dua. And to be able to Make these type of du'a at the time of our death. We need to start living the lifestyle that will get us the rahmah of Allah, the forgiveness of Allah. And we all know Allah is very merciful. Allah is very kind. He's forgiving one. He loves to forgive. Not only he forgives, he loves to forgive. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa. Ya Allah, you are the one who forgives and you love to forgive. Subhanallah. We human beings, we don't love to forgive. If a person keeps on doing wrong to us again and again, again and again, and he's doing the same mistake repeatedly, he's doing the same thing again and again, after some time we'll give up and we'll say, you know, I, I won't accept this again. But Allah loves to forgive. So, it's the lifestyle that would determine, that would decide that what situation we'll be facing at the time of our death. Aisha radiyallahu anha says in another hadith Ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa bil maut Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of his death he had water around him he was dipping his hand into the water and then applying the water on his face because of the hardships of death <coughs> he was trying to get some water on his face and he was making this dua, Allahumma a'inni ala ghamarat al-maut. Ya Allah, 
Help me against the hardships of death. وَسَكَرَاتِ الْمَوْتِ Help me against the agony of death. So, those are the difficult times. That time is very difficult. At the time of death, when the soul is departing the body, we can imagine that a little pain, a little cut on our body, how painful that is because we are having some soul alive inside this body. And when we cut that place, a person whose finger might be cut, at the time of being cut, the person goes through a lot of pain, swear pain. The reason of the pain is the soul is coming out of that part of the body now. It's going to get out of that finger. So imagine when the soul is departing the whole body. There is a narration that someone asked uh, once uh, that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salatu was was asked. How does the death feel? What is the feeling of the death when the body is when the soul is departing the body? He says it seems like a person having a cotton, and in the middle of that cotton he put a thorny branch of a tree, then he pulls that branch. How the cotton will keep on pulling, the threads of the cotton will keep on pulling with the thorns of that branch. It feels that this is how someone is pulling something from inside us. Of course, soul is departing the body. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith that the time is so difficult that if the person will have a sword in his hand and be able to move and do something, he'll kill everyone around him because of the pain of death. He wants to do something at that time. This is how painful it is. With little hardships that we face in our lives, we give up a lot of things that we normally won't give up and we are not supposed to do. We do, we will do a lot of things that we are not supposed to do because of some hardships. Shaitan knows the hardships of death, therefore he tries to use that opportunity. And he comes to the person at that time, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs us in the hadith, that that is the time when he tries the most to turn the person away from his deed. By making false promises, that if you turn away from deen, and <coughs> if you give up La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, then you won't have these hardships. False promises. You are going through these hardships because you are Muslim. And still you have an opportunity. You may be facing worse situation after your death, so still you have an opportunity. Give up this thing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith that he tries to the extent that he would come in a form of <coughs> this person's father or grandfather or some people that he loved in his life and they have passed away before him, he would come in their form telling him that I'm your father, I'm your grandfather or I'm your mother and before my death I changed my deen and therefore I was saved. If you like to save yourself, you better change now. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, if the person used to give up his deen because of people in this life, he would give up deen at that time also. And if that person had the importance of deen more than anyone else, and he would not give up deen because of anyone else, then that person will not give up deen even at that time and will be able to hold to his deen or her deen at that time. Again, it comes back to the same thing. The life, the type of life that we live. If we get used to giving up deen because of what people like us to do, because of how people want to see us, just to please friends and family, then of course, at that time when shaitan will come in that form, the person will be willing to give up anything. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was making these du'as at the time of his death. One of the things that the first du'a 
a message that gives us also, normally it's not good to make dua to die. That, Ya Allah, I like to die. Ya Allah, just take me back. Ya Allah, I don't want to live. Making that dua, that type of dua, because of hardships of this life, is not good, is not allowed. Yes, sometime when a person is going through some feelings of the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a time comes in every person's life, might be when a person is trying to be good and trying to do virtuous deeds, and all of a sudden a feeling comes that of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at that time the person feels like making dua that, Ya Allah, take me back to you, I like to come back to you. For that reason is allowed to make these dua. But because of the hardships and difficulties of this world, we are not allowed to make dua for that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making dua take me back to you at the time of death simply means that at that time when the person is looking forward for the rahmah of Allah, for the mercy of Allah, there is nothing wrong that Ya Allah to say that Ya Allah, I look forward to come back to you and see you. Bilal radiallahu anhu at the time of his death when his wife saw that he's taking the this might be the last moments of his life. She started weeping. So he said, what's the reason to cry for? He said, as far as I'm concerned, I'm very happy. Because غَدًا نَلْقَ الْأَحِبَّةِ مُحَمَّدًا وَحِزْبَةِ Oh, tomorrow I will be meeting all of my friends. I would meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the rest of the companions. So I'm looking forward to go back there. This is when the person has hope in the rahmah of Allah and in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next chapter is about being nice to the people who are at their deathbed or a person about whom it's known that he will be dying soon. Maybe doctors have said that, okay, these are the last he won't survive with this disease. <coughs> At the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these type of situations occurred when a person committed a type of crime, whereas from the Islamic point of view, the punishment for that was that person, it was a capital penalty for that and uh, the person has to be killed for that. Like a married person committing adultery, the punishment according to Sharia is rajim, stoning the person to death. So in that situation, how did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam deal with those people? This is very important for us to know from two perspectives. One is, people at their deathbed, how to deal with those people. Number two, people who we know that they are wrongdoers, they have committed sins, how to deal with those people and how to treat those people. Of course, number one, people who are in their deathbed or they're very sick and we know that they won't survive, they won't recover from this as far as we know. The instructions we have from the hadith is try to be as good as we can to those people. Tell them some good words. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in one of the hadiths, when you visit these type of people, make dua for them that Ya Allah give them a long life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says it will make that person feel good. And it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decide how long this person will live. But at least saying these type of words it does not hurt, although we know that well, the time has been fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But still Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, make that dua for him. It will make him feel good that at least you look forward for him to live longer with you. Once a sahabiyah came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A woman came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed zina. 
So apply the Islamic punishment on me and I'm married, Ya Rasulullah. She knew what the punishment was. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, You may be mistaken. Do you know what you're saying? She says, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, I know what I'm talking about. But Ya Rasulullah, I like to clean myself. I don't like to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while being unclean and having this dirt of the sin on me. So therefore, whatever punishment have been assigned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applied on me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after confirming from her that really she committed that sin, he said to her, wait for some days. Because what about if you're pregnant? And really it turned out that she was pregnant. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, we cannot apply this punishment on you at this time. So therefore, we will wait until you deliver the baby. He said to her guardian, Ahsin ilayha, be nice to her. Don't treat her in a bad way because she committed this mistake. Look how he's treating the sinners. After she delivered the baby, she came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, now I have delivered the baby, so clean me. This, these were her words. فَطَهِرْنِي يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Purify me, Ya Rasulullah. Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, not yet. Because at this time, this baby needs you. After the two years period of breastfeeding is over, then you come to me. And before the two years period, she tried to train her son to eat bread. And one day she came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, and she intentionally had her son hold a piece of bread in his hand. Ya Rasulullah, look, he's holding to a piece of bread, so he doesn't need me anymore. Anyone can feed him now. Ya Rasulullah, purify me. And he applied the punishment on her. There are very important things that we learn from this hadith. One thing that we need to know is people like Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een committing these type of mistakes. How did they do it? How would a Sahabi, a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would commit these type of sin? Remember, it's not that they did it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them for these things also. As he chose them for a lot of other things, these things were chosen for them also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to establish a full sharia, full deen. In that deen, we need to learn how to make up for mistakes also. There were some mistakes, some type of mistakes that were not against the prophethood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do those mistakes. For example, forgetting the number of rak'ahs. Instead of paying, make, making four rak'ahs, making salam two rak'ahs. Instead of sitting after two rak'ahs, getting up for the third rak'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do these type of mistakes. So that the ummah will learn how to make up for these mistakes. Otherwise, there was no way for us to learn these things. He is always leading the salah and no one would know how to make up for these type of mistakes. We learned them from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So his mistakes were also rahmah for the ummah. But of course, sins are against the nabuah. A prophet of Allah can make a mistake but cannot commit a sin. Sins were against the nabuah. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow his prophet and messenger of Allah to commit that sin. So he chose Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een to do it. And after they did it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guaranteed them the forgiveness and the Jannah. When this Sahabiyyah was stoned to death, 
رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said to Sahaba Ridwan Allahi alayhi majma'een, she got a type of forgiveness that if the whole world will get their share of this forgiveness, they all will go to Jannah. And the Sahabi who committed the mistake, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said similar type of words about him, but he used the word Ahlul Madina that he got a type of forgiveness from Allah that if that forgiveness is divided to all the people of Medina Munawwara, it's enough to take all of them to Jannah. Treating these type of people, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu while they were stoning one of the, the Sahabi who made, it, who made this mistake, when they were stoning him, some blood flew from that person on the cloth of Khalid radiallahu anhu. So Khalid radiallahu anhu said some words about him that look at the sinner or that this dirty blood came on me, these type of words. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no Khalid, don't say anything like this. This person is guaranteed the forgiveness and the jannah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't say anything like this about this person. And here we learn how to deal with people who have committed these sins. A Sahabi, in the beginning days of Islam, drinking alcohol was allowed. So one of the Sahaba, after it was forbidden, one of the Sahaba made that mistake. And when they brought him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa one of the Sahaba said a bad word about him. That Ya Rasulullah, look at this, and he said a bad word at this person that he drinks alcohol. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La tu'inu shaytan ala akhikum. Don't help shaytan against your brother. You need to help your brother. Don't help shaytan. When you see these bad words, you are only pleasing shaytan. So subhanallah, what a beautiful teaching that even with these type of mistakes, we need to help these people come out of it. Help them get better. And not to say any bad word against these people. Who knows, after doing this mistake, they get the forgiveness and the rahmah of Allah, and they will go to Jannah by saying bad words. We will be responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, and will be questioned about, about it, that a person who was forgiven, how come you said these type of words about that person? So we'll have to pay that person for it on the day of judgment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that no matter what type of sin that person have committed, still we have no right of using bad words against that person. No right to curse at that person. And it will, if we do that, it will be only something that we are doing against ourselves and it will be helping shaitan against that person if we keep on cursing a person for the wrongdoings that the person do. You know what will happen? That person then doesn't want to get better, doesn't want to come closer to us because we are only talking bad about him. So in order for that person to know that, no, Islam is still accepting me, we have to show that person, okay, with everything that you have done, still, alhamdulillah, you, are, you can be a good person. You have a lot of potential of being a good man, a good person. And here, just ask Allah for forgiveness. Inshallah, everything will be forgiven. There were so many people who lived in the past, who lived a terrible life, life totally against Sharia, against Islam. And finally, when they repented to Allah, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, and they changed their life, they became some of the greatest scholars of Islam. And look at the type of, uh, at the life of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. What type of life they were living before Islam and after the change, subhanAllah, they became the greatest people of the ummah. Umar radiallahu anhu was planning to commit the worst sin that ever exists on the surface of the earth. The worst sin that a human being can commit. Trying to kill a prophet of Allah. This is the sin that he was going to commit and he was trying to commit. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up his heart for the hidayah and he got the hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and here he becomes one of the greatest people of the ummah with such an iman that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I saw in my dream that he was, his iman was weighed with the iman of the rest of the ummah and his iman was heavier than the iman of the whole ummah. This is when people change. So, a very important lesson from this hadith that when we see sinners, 
when we know that people are committing sins, we should not help shaitan against them for these people to get worse by talking against them. Try to get them closer to you to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Talk good about them. In spite of all their evils, say the good things about them so they will come closer to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we will through that we will be able to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the deen of Allah and to the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we need to do to the ones that are doing wrong in our communities of our either elders or youngsters. This is the way of bringing them back. Just like when we see a sick person, a person who is sick, we don't curse at this person, oh look, curse at this man because he has a headache, because he has a toothache. No, we feel sorry for these people. This is also another type of disease when the person is committing sins and having a habit of committing these sins is a disease. We should feel sorry for this person that is only preparing the hellfire for himself or herself. So let us get that person out of that situation. So this is the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the hikmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the rahmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the ummah. Otherwise, normally people like us who feel about themselves that, oh, we are getting better Muslims and I'm a very good Muslim and uh, I'm doing all of my salah in the masjid, I'm doing this. So as soon as I see a person who's committing sins, I'll start looking down at that person and start talking against that person, start hating that person. No, this is not the way that the deen is teaching us. In fact, deen is teaching us the totally, totally the opposite that with these type of people, we need to give them more attention and we need to say something good about them and bring them back to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the right understanding of this deen and give all of us the tawfiq to follow it the way we were taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimin wa al-muslimat wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.